Hi, my name is Father Nick Ostriaco, and I'm a professor. I teach in the biology and the theology departments, and it's a great privilege to talk about Albert the Great. And when I became a Dominican, now 18 years ago, and I was asked about my religious name, uh, they were expecting me to choose Albert because of my training, both in biology and my, my uh, plan to, to, um, to pursue theology. Nonetheless, I chose Pierre Giorgio Frassati for many, many other reasons. But what I hope to be able to share with you today is something about Albert. So I'd like to, the first part of the talk is going to be about Albert. So you get a sense of who Albert is and how Albert has actually shaped the Dominican way of looking at science and religion, not only in his own thought, but because he's also the teacher of Thomas Aquinas. And in such a wonderful way, it's the synthesis of Albert and Thomas together that generates the kind of intellectual paradigm. In 1250, Albert is part of the first group of Dominican friars who sits down to figure out what sort of education a Dominican friar should undertake. And in many ways, he sets down the foundations for the education that would shape friars for 800 years. And, but the bulk of my talk I think is just to demonstrate how faith and reason come together. So often my students will say, how do you do this? How do you bring faith and reason together? And instead of telling them, I usually end up showing them. And so I thought in the course of this lecture, I'd show you how one way of bringing faith and reason together to deal with the question of God, what is God, and how God, how God exists and how answering those questions actually makes a case for why science and the scientific enterprise is possible and intelligible. So I'm just gonna, this is Albert. These are his dates. We're not quite sure exactly when he was born. We do know that he was born at around 1200 because by the time he died in 1280, there are witnesses who say that he's at least 80 years old. So that's why it's around 1200. He's from Swabia in Germany. And ba his basic story is he gets sent down to Padua, the University of Padua in Italy, where he encounters the Dominicans. He encounters the friars' preachers, the preaching of Jordan of Saxony, who is at that time the immediate successor of St. Dominic, the second master of the order. Uh, Father Bruno Cadere is the 87th master of the order, and so we go back basically to the second master of the order, and we have, uh, we have Albert, and he enters the Dominican order then. And the early part of his life as a friar is he's a professor. As I point out, Dominicans are geeks for God, and so he is a major geek for God. And so in this image, and I pick this image because it tells you the primary facets of his life. First of all, he's a friar. He's working, wearing the habit of the order, the white and the black. He's a bishop because he's ordained. Uh, let me get my dates. In 1260, he's ordained as Bishop of Radisbon. He is also a scholar of, the law, of, of philosophical and theological texts, and we'll see this in a minute. But you see he is looking at a plant, and that's also because He's a natural scientist. So he's a Dominican friar, a bishop, a philosopher, a theologian, and a natural scientist, a geek for God in, in, the, in the fullest sense of the word. And he is remembered in philosophy for being the individual in the Middle Ages who really restores Aristotle into the curriculum. And so I just put this as a translation of his commentary on Aristotle's On Animals, written 1256 to 1260. And he is the one who introduces his student, Thomas Aquinas, to the study of Aristotle. And so this is a wonderful picture of mentor and mentee. And it, I think it's really uh, interesting that some people are meant to be brilliant students and others are meant to be brilliant teachers. And it's striking how we often forget that every student had a teacher. And Thomas Aquinas had a brilliant teacher, uh, Albert the Great. And he's a scientist. This is a quote from one of his texts, which in many ways we take for granted today. But 800 years ago would have been considered very radical. Experiment is the only safe guide in investigation. 
this is his, his text on the vegetables, on the animal, on the plants. And um, his most famous book is On Animals, and it's a great tome. It's, it's a Summa Zoologiae. So if you have the Summa Theologiae of Aquinas, a summary of theology, you have a Summa of animal life. And there is a very famous, important point and part of this called the De Falconibus. It is for 300 years, it was the text on how to raise and care for hunting falcons. And there were 24 chapters in this book. You had differences between birds of prey and other birds. You had different species of falcons, training of falcons, cures for sick falcons. So if your falcon got sick, what would you do? And then he talked about two new species of falcons. And it's interesting that we can go 200 years later to England, and you have hunting books that cite te uh, you know, verse for verse directly from the Del Falconibus. Now, there's also a sense that, this is that his um, summary on animals includes one of the first explicit discussions of an experiment he had read in Aristotle that ostriches ate iron, and when they ate iron, they would take, they would basically bury their heads in the sand. And so there is a story, there's a text in the, in the De Animalibus on the summary on animals, where he walks around with iron in his habit pocket, and when he runs into an ostrich, I, I'm like, where would he have run into an ostrich in Europe? But he, has, he runs into an ostrich, and he throws the iron, and he wants to see, does the ostrich eat the iron? And in fact, it does not. And so he reports in his De Anibalibus that, that, nope, they actually don't eat iron, and therefore Aristotle was wrong. And in, an, in a time when authority, especially textual authority, was was raised above experiment and sense perception, you have this radical change in the way we, be, we look for truth. Uh, what is often not known is that Albert is considered the person who discovers the chemical arsenic. And he's an alchemist. And a lot of my students will say, why was he doing alchemy? Well, I didn't know either, so I went looking. And it turns out that the, the whole field of alchemy, which would precede chemistry, uh, was triggered by a theological question. And the theological question was the following. Could the devil change lead into gold? And well, you can't tell that from the Bible. But the assumption was that if human beings could change lead into gold, then another creature, a smarter creature, a more powerful creature, like the devil could do so. And so that begins, uh, that triggers the, the whole process of trying to figure out whether or not gold can be derived from lead. Today you can do that, it just takes a lot of, it, it takes a huge accelerator, enormous amount of uh, particles that you're shooting at each other, and, you know, we can do that now. But they wanted to do that, they wanted to see whether that could be done using the basic, well, what we would call chemical tools. So um, he dies in 1280, and one of the most striking things that you see in his history, he becomes provincial, he becomes bishop. He's only bishop for two years, and what's striking about his being bishop is he refuses to take a horse because the Dominican order of the time, because of a vow of poverty, we wouldn't take horses. So he walked all over his diocese. So he was called the bishop with boots. He resigns two years after his appointment to the episcopacy because, one, he doesn't feel that it's appropriate for a religious to be an, a bishop, and second, he wishes to return to studies. He, you know, and so, so he, he returns to studies. Uh, what's striking is there are records of him probably suffering from Alzheimer's. So at the very end of his life, he doesn't remember anything. After writing a hundred books, he, he writes 100 books, um, 38 volumes in Latin, uh, small text. And, um, but at the end of his life, he, know, he doesn't remember much from what we say. There is one, rec one, one anecdote that the thing he remembers at the very end of his life is that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. 
and that is it. So I thought what I'd do today um, is to talk about the integration of faith and reason. And instead of talking about it, I wanted to demonstrate that to you. How, how do you bring faith and reason together? And um, this is Fides and Ratia, so we're moving 800 years into the future. We're now Pope St. John Paul II in 1998. This is the opening line of his famous encyclical, his letter to the world, to the church and to the world, about faith and reason. He says, faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And I have the great privilege of teaching a, a colloquium, an honors colloquium in, on faith and science this semester. And um, we have wonderful conversations on, on that. And, I, and, I, and like tonight, we're going to be talking about does God exist? And so what I thought I'd do is in 30 minutes or so, uh, to show you how we do what we do in this colloquium. The kind of go, help you go through the kind of thinking that we go through in the class to illustrate and to try to model to, to my students how I, a Dominican and therefore how I think Albert and Thomas and 800 years of men and women who have been searching for the truth in the habit of St. Dominic would attempt to do this. And I'm going to address this by looking at two questions. What is God? Notice, I, what is God, not who is God? What is God, and then does God exist? And I would like to suggest at the very end that these questions explain why science is possible. And so the reason why um, I work and, I've, and I've, I've toiled at bringing science and religion together is because for me to be a person who's able to do both, it's gotta make sense in my head. And I, and I, I tell my students that in many ways, the class is an invitation to go on a, on a journey that I've been going on for 20 years now, um, and it's a, it's, it's a journey that will continue. So we'll begin with what is God? And I'm going to just, again, go through the thinking process, the reasoning process. Let's think about how we define things. So what is a dog? Now, someone could say a dog is an animal with four legs. Is that true? Is that enough? Now, it's interesting, little kids, if you've ever seen little kids, you go, dog, and they see a cat, they go, dog. And you go, no, 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 that's a cat. And the kid goes, what? And, you, and you, you, you have to train the kid to look for those characteristics that, that uniquely distinguish dogs and cats. And so we're just going to say a dog is an animal that barks. We're going to assume that nothing else barks. And barking is what distinguishes dogs from other dogs. And we go around defining things by looking for that characteristic that says this is this is this kind of thing that distinguishes it from all of the other things and so when we are defining a, do a dog we have to figure out that one characteristic that distinguishes dogs from non-dogs you see that now this is interesting because if we have to define God we need to identify that characteristic that distinguishes him from non-gods. We're, we're doing reason, you understand? Now, here's the strange thing, of course. We've never really had an experience of, of, of God. Uh, but we have, this is striking, an experience of non-gods. And we call non-gods creatures. So one of the things that Aquinas will say, um, and this is a Dominican insight in the Thomistic tradition, is what is the defining characteristic of creatures? And when I do this, I've got to say the following. What is held in common by electrons, tables, dogs, angels, and galaxies? Now, I have to put angels in there because if not, my students who are 21st century materialists uh, and determinists by nature will go, hmm, and they'll say electrons, tables, dogs, and galaxies, and they'll say stuff. That's what I get. They go, all of this is made up of stuff. And then I put angels in the like, Ugh! they don't quite know. And that's important because they're so used to answering questions from physics, and we're dealing here with metaphysics, which is the study of being, things that are, generally speaking, rather than things that are in particular. Now, what I'm going to do is St. Thomas will propose that in all creatures, what they are can be distinguished from that they are. My students will go, what? That doesn't make any sense. And I say, to put it another way, 
he proposes that in creatures, essence can be distinguished from existence. And let me explain that to you. So what is a unicorn? Right? And I'll show you that. Right? And you'll go, the essence of a unicorn is that it is a horse with a single horn. Yep. Okay, now how about this? Okay, great for millennials. There he is. And you'll say the essence of Harry Potter is that he's a boy magician imagined by J.K. Rowling. Now, I want you to notice this. We can understand unicorns, Harry Potter's pencils, even if they do not really exist. Because unicorns do not really exist. They, they are creatures of the intellect. They exist in the mind. You can think about them, but they don't really, really understand, really, really exist. We can understand their essences without knowing if they exist or not. And anything you think about, you can think about whether or not they are real or not. Real in the sense that you and I are real. And that is because their essence is different from their existence. And so we have to define creatures this way. Essence is not equal to their existence. So here's the case. If creatures are beings whose essence can be separated from their existence, then God is that being whose essence cannot be separated from his existence. This is Aquinas using his reason. In other words, God is that being whose essence is existence. Now, it's really striking because I tell my students, properly speaking, God is that being whose essence is existing. Notice, this is what it is. And in order for me to show this to you, I want you to compare. A dog is that animal that bark, barks. Barking is what distinguishes dogs from non-dogs. God is that being whose essence is his existence. Now notice, that his, his essence is his existence is what distinguishes God from non-gods. Because as I suggested to you, non-gods are those things whose essence can be understood separately from whether or not they exist. And so you say, Thomas will say in question three of the first part of a summa, God is the act of existing. God is existing. And I always tell my students this, God is a verb. You and I are nouns. And we experience nouns all the time. But God is a verb. And my students will go, whoa, that's deep. And I go, it's deep in the sense that you may get it, but you really don't. And that's really important. Now, here's striking. You see, this is the reason part, right? This is how we've thought through dogs and cats and unicorns, and we've got to God. Where does the faith part come in? See, St. Thomas will say, look what happens if you go to the burning bush. What, what does God say to Moses when Moses says, who are you? He says, I am who am. And he says, isn't this amazing? God tells you, I am, and reason says, he is. As in the existing. And so what happens is, God is a verb. And this is where faith and reason are coming together. Now notice again, this is incredibly conceptually mysterious. Because, can you imagine the act of running without a runner? So I'm going to say, all right, think of a runner. Now remove the runner and think of the running. You can't do that. You and I experience the world primarily through nouns. We cannot speak about a verb without a noun. And yet Thomas is pointing out that in an analogous sense, God is a verb. And there is a deep mystery about that, which is proper because he is very different from us. And when we say that we understand God, we have to be very careful. Because we cannot really imagine the act of existing without an existing thing. And so God is always beyond our imagining and our understanding. And you're able to articulate something by saying God is a verb. You think it says something, but it doesn't say completely what he is. What you're actually saying is he's not a noun. And that should affect, for those, for those of us here who are 
theists who are believers, that should really challenge us to think about what it means to say, I believe in God. Now, we read Richard Dawkins in my class. It's one of, they, they go home over Christmas break. They reach Richard Dawkins. And a couple years ago, I had a parent who was very upset because he said, you know, his daughter lost his, her faith over Christmas. And I said, look, class hasn't even started yet. Let's give the class a chance. Now, Dawkins will say, if God created everything, then who created God? This is a standard account. Who created God? And Thomas and the, the Thomistic tradition will say, well, can a triangle have four sides? And you're like, no. By a definition, a triangle cannot have four sides. So by definition, God cannot be made. No one made God because he is existing. So the idea is that they're logically impossible. If someone asks you, why does God exist? Existing is what God does. It is also what he is. If someone asks you, why does a triangle have three sides? We say, having the three sides is what a triangle does. That's what it is. That's a triangle. So God, by definition, is... That's it. See, he is. Now, my students will say right away, they'll go, you've just defined God, but then, heck, I could define God as a pumpkin. It doesn't mean anything. Defining stuff doesn't mean anything. So we've got to go, does he exist? We've defined something, but defining stuff doesn't make any sense unless the stuff we're defining actually exists. And so this is the second part of our exercise in faith and reason. How do, we, how do we deal with this? And I ask you this question. Did your great, 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 great grandfather exist? How many of you say he did? What is the proof of that? So we go, yes, absolutely. I have no doubt, all right? What's the proof? You, okay? You are the definitive proof, you see? Because your great to the seventh grandfather's existence explains your existence. Now notice, he's not the only explanation. Your mom and dad had a pretty important part in that too. But he, the great to the seventh grandfather has to be there to explain your existence. You are an effect of his causality, you see? Your great to the seventh grandfather caused you. Now, I have to, because when I notice, I use the word cause. And when, when we as moderns, especially as Newton, post Newtonian, post Einstein, when we think cause, we usually think about me hitting something, me changing something. But in the classical understanding, your great to the seventh grandfather caused you, he explains you. Now, there is a principle, this is actually not scholastic, this is very modern, by Leibniz. There's a principle of sufficient reason. Every effect must have a reason or a cause. This is an affirmation of this intelligibility and structure of the world. For every entity X, if X exists, then there is sufficient explanation for X. And to put it simply, causes explain effects. And in fact, we can infer a cause from an effect. You know, I, I tell my students, the first day of college, you walk into your room, and it's a brand new room in, in McDermott, and boom, there's stuff all over the bed. You go, my roommate's here. You infer a cause from the effect. And we do this all the time. We assume, and this is the principle of sufficient reason, there is an assumption that every effect has a cause. And in fact, this is one of the, the principal foundational uh, presuppositions of a scientific endeavor. I go, my students and I go hunting for genes because we see something happening and we assume there's a gene there. And we go looking, now, does there have to be a gene there? No, but we assume there is one because of the very nature of reality. So when we go, does God exist? Here's the thing, here's the thing. We say, yes, absolutely, in the same way that your great to the seventh grandfather exists. Why is that? Because of the fall. Remember, creatures, you and me, our essence is distinct from our existence. You know, and people go, what? And I, if I ask 
you know, um, Miguel, who's back there. I go, Miguel, you know, why are you, stop existing, Miguel. He can't do it. You, existence doesn't properly belong to you. If I say, go to sleep, Miguel, he can do that. But if I say, stop existing, now when I go, what does it mean to stop existing? My students will say, oh, we'll just die. I'm like, no, 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 no. Existence and non-existence is different from life versus death. You can say, kill yourself, Miguel. He can do that. Don't do that, Miguel. All right? But if I say, stop existing, Miguel, he can't because the opposite of existing is non-existing. We don't call that dying. We call that being annihilated. You simply cease to be. You just, bing, you're gone. You and I don't do that. Uh, we don't actually control whether or not we appear or disappear uh, in, at, at this particular moment. Now, so creatures can't do that because existence is not within their powers. It is not within what sort, the sort of being they are. They could exist, so they could not exist. Now, non-existing creatures like a unicorn is an essence without existence. An existing creature is an essence plus existence. You see, there's this existence that's given to things. Now, it's in, again, a couple years ago when I was teaching this, one of my students goes, oh my God, I just realized I am God's imaginary friend. And that's a deep insight because when you and I have imaginary friends, and psych developmental psychologists will point out that imaginary friends is actually a healthy component of human cognitive development where we're able to learn how to form and nourish the relational skills that are important for living in society. So all of us have had some imaginary friend. Our imaginary friends remain imaginary. We can't make them real. But when God has an imaginary friend, he can make it real. And, and, and in a sense, we are. And, and one of my students said, well, Father, does that mean that he knows me? And I said, absolutely. Because you see, every time you think God forgets you, all you have to do is you go look in a mirror. And if you can see yourself, you still exist. Then he's still imagining you into reality. You see, because if he didn't think about you, you would disappear. In the same way that we can imagine things fictional characters, that's as much as we can do, but we can't give them the real existence that you can. So what happens, you see, is you discover that creaturely existence is not necessary. We could have been, we are. There's something about us, we are contingent beings. This is what contingency means. So <coughs> here's the thing. If creatures could not exist, if there was an alternate universe where they could, then why do, they, why do you and I exist now? <coughs> why don't we simply disappear? And this is where the faith and reason will say, they exist because they have received their existence from another. You see? So this, in the same way that great to the seventh grandfather explains you, he explains your existence because in some way you couldn't be here without him. What the Thomistic tradition, the Dominican commentatorial tradition, Albert, Thomas, Suarez, everything will say is that God's exist, existence explains the existence of everything else, especially those things that are not God. And remember, if we recall that what I just said, that God is the act of existing, he's the only being, he explains why contingent beings exist. So if I go, why are you here? Because my great to the seventh grandfather lived probably 300 years ago, plus or minus, because we're expecting a 20-year generational span. And so we say, why do we say it's reasonable for God to exist? Because he explains why I'm existing now. Now notice, a lot of people will say, and this is what we're going to deal with in class tonight, a lot of people say, well, he explains the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. Yes, he does, but he also explains why you don't simply just disappear now. We're not just talking about 13.8 billion years ago. We're talking about now. And I go here, if God did not now, um, when I have these questions, and when I'm at MIT, we're having these conversations, this is what my, my friends will say. Uh, why do contingent, 
my students, my friends will say, who are scientists, they just do. They just do. We don't, they just do. And I go, but look at this. This is unreasonable. We have never seen an effect without a cause. You're actually undermining the principle of sufficient reason, which you assume in science. Now, you have another response. So they go, I have had my friends say this. Some scientific law will one day explain why we all exist. All right? And then I go, but then why do these scientific laws exist? And you go one step back. And you see, what's interesting is God explains why scientific laws exist. And he explains why science is even possible. And this, is, this is one of the things that I want to communicate in my classroom when we're dealing with science and with faith and science, that, that, the, that God is a reasonable claim, not only in its own merits, but it provides an intelligibility to the scientific enterprise and the actual task for what we're doing. Now, I have two, three physicists in my, in my uh, colloquium this semester, and we, we talk about string theory. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with string theory, one of the large unsolved problems in contemporary physics is the resolution and, and the, the bringing together of, of Albert Einstein's account of general relativity, which was confirmed spectacularly two weeks ago with the discovery of gravitational waves by the two LIGO detectors, one in Louisiana and the other one in Washington State. Wonderful. How to reconcile this account of large stuff, so, so black holes are large, large stuff, with the whole account of quantum mechanics, uh, which deals with the small stuff. So you've got the really large stuff, and the really small stuff. And it turns out that if you take the equations of general relativity and try to apply them at the length of very small dimensions, they give rise to a division of zero, which means it's an impossible. And if you take quantum mechanics and you try to apply that in the realm of the very large, it also becomes zero, infinite, divided by zero, which is, in, which is unintelligible. And so one of the great questions today is how you bring these two things together. There is a search for what is called the gut, the grand unifying theory. And the best candidate is string theory, where string theory posits that of the 12 basic particles that we know of, each particle is composed of a string, an incredibly small string. And this string vibrates. And it's the vibrations of the string that explains reality. And so string theorists will say that you and I are musical notes. It's a beautiful image. It's the musical notes of all the strings playing in the world. Now, we've never seen strings. In fact, it's very difficult to imagine us ever seeing a string because a string is incredibly small. And there are that one of the striking things is that strings exist in 14 dimensions. I'm like, four, I, I know up, down, left, right, front, back, then I've got past and future, and now I've got 10 others. But then my, my students will go, yeah, that makes sense. And I go, what you're saying is that string theory explains the reason why we're we're able to hold to this unintelligible nature. We, you know, we don't really get strings, but we think the string is there because it explains what would happen today. And I say, in many ways, a theologian, not just a theologian, my grandmother is doing the same thing. It, when, we, when we think about God, we're saying that we may not necessarily understand everything about God. In fact, you can't really understand about everything about God. But God explains stuff about the world today in the way that a string, the positing of strings that are as large as the Planck length, which is incredibly teeny, 10 to the minus 23, really, really, really small, um, which is, un, you, we can't access that right now, but we say that thing exists 
even though it's weird, it's, it exists in 14 plus dimensions, which no one of us can imagine. Can you imagine 14 dimensions? I can't. And they're supposed to be really, really small. So my hand is now moving through 14 dimensions. I'm just going to take it for granted. I'm going to take have faith in the physicist who says that. And all that I, I want to um, convey to my students is that there is a role for faith in science. There is a role for faith in, in, in Christian theology. They're not exactly the same. In fact, they're, 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 they're incredibly different because this is the difference. A string can never speak back to you. God can. And so the kind of dynamic that governs what should be a Christian faith is a personal one. This morning, my students were had read Saint for Big Civ. I teach a colloquium for Sophomore Civ. My students read the first question of St. Thomas' Summa on philosophy and theology, and we're discussing faith. And the question that came up that St. Thomas poses in one of his Neapolitan uh, homilies during Lent in, I believe it was like in, in 1260 or so, was he claimed that an old woman, an uneducated old woman, had more, had more certain knowledge of God than the best theologian in the world. He said that an illiterate woman has better knowledge of God, and we had a two-hour conversation and seminar about that. And my students were like, what does that mean to say that my grandmother, at nine, she didn't finish fifth grade, she, was, she died at nine, she was my Lola, knew God better than any theologian. They were a little stunned by that. And after an hour, we got around to the, to the notion that the theologian knows God like a physician knows you and me. But my grandmother knows God in the way that a wife knows a husband. And there are two kinds of knowledge, you see? And I, we go, well, who knows you better, your wife or your doctor? And there, there was a pause. There was a pause, because you see, they struggle with the knowledge of science. You see, they, science for them is the best kind of knowledge. And they realize, no, person, there's something about personal knowledge that is so deep and profound about you that you would call that tr truer knowledge than the fact that you have blood and the fact that you respire oxygen. So you have this very personal sense where God's existence explains the existence of everything we call this, he is the first cause. He is the first cause. In the same way that your great to the seventh grandfather was a cause, he's not the only cause. God is a cause, he is the first cause, but there are many secondary causes that explain the existence of other causes and effects. And I point out that science studies these secondary causes. But these secondary causes presuppose the first cause, who is God, and that one of the reasons, and this is just one, we, we, we spend a semester dealing this, one of the reasons why uh, religion and science are compatible is because God provides the intelligibility and possibility of science. Thank you very much. Twelve forty-five. we said finish by 1245. So any questions? Thoughts. I threw a lot of metaphysics at you. Usually it takes two hours at a pop with my students, and we just go through it thought slide by slide, and they think through, and they argue. Yes? Mm -hmm. No, and you're very, you're absolutely correct. Uh, that presupposes an account of truth. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a notion that they're both true because they represent what really is, right? Uh, I, think, I think that Aquinas would, would, would say that, that um, maybe a better way to put it is it is deeper knowledge. They're both true, right? They're deeper. Like Bio 103 gives... Well, see, so, so oh, the net, the 
lecture that we go, uh, which I didn't have a chance to go through, is so what can you know? What can you know about this what, right? So, so if you walk into your room, if you walk into the room, your freshman room, and you notice um, there was, you know, the books are tied, and you go, there was a person here. You know, and I say for some of the rooms in Aquinas where I lived for 10 years, sometimes you're not sure if a tornado lived there or a person lived there. And, and the idea is that when you look at creation and we look around us, we see intelligibility. When we see order. So the example I give is, uh, we did this class with Seth Pinches. So Seth is a senior, he has Norwegian roots. And I say, look, here's Seth. What do we know of his great to the seventh grandfather? And I go, well, he's probably not African American, because even after seven generations, the dominant genes associated with uh, the traits we see in Equatorial Africa would not have been able to be, quote, diluted out of the organism. This is the biological claim. And I go, Seth is a mutant. And they all laugh. Because Caucasians are mutants, right? They are lost. They're, Caucasians are mutants who have lost the function of some genes that were associated with life living in the tropics. Um, and so from looking at Seth, I can deal, I can go back and I, I, I don't know his name. So I don't know the, his name. I don't even know what he looked like. But I know some things about him. And I think uh, Aquinas would say, well, if you look at the world around you, you see that it's, it's intelligible and it's structured and there's reason there. So we, get, we don't know God's name, but we know that this what must have intellect and will. He's not our tornado, he's a roommate. Now, and here's the thing, right? So in the Quinn, you, you properly point out, and is that, and this is where my students will say, but how is this related to God is love? Because I can't, and, I, and this properly pointing out, you know, I can't talk to a verb. And the example I gave here is the Holy Spirit. Like, when I was going through formation, I never prayed to the Holy Spirit. And I was talking to my, to my novice master, the late Father Clem Burns. And uh, he said, well, he's very charismatic. Like, he's really into the, he was into the Holy Spirit. And God willing, he is in the Holy Spirit now. And, um, and, he, he, and he said, well, why? And I go, Father, I just can't pray to a bird. Every time I think the Holy Spirit, I think of a dove. And I can't pray to a, a bird. It just doesn't make any sense. And he said, brother, that's right. Now I want you to think of the Holy Spirit as a roaring fire. And that changed everything for me. You see? So, so, so he said, the Holy Spirit is a raging fire that into which you and everyone else is thrown into the love of God. Ah, oh, wow. That was an image that I have taken and remembered since. And I will take it forever until, God willing, I see that fire face to face. And it's, it's, and it's because you, go, you have to go from the impersonal, what can reason really be, uh, tell you, to, to what persons reveal. And, I, and the example I give in class is, you know, you're a guy, you're walking around across campus, and all of a sudden you see a very attractive woman. Wow, she's hot. Now, you can tell that she's there. You can tell she's a woman. You can tell she's attractive. But you do not know her name. She must reveal herself to you. And it's only after she reveals herself to you that the chemistry, got, hopefully, Will, will ignite. And, and this is the same thing with Christian theology. There's an account where you can only go so far. You can only, and, 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 and I think your point is correct in that the grandmother, basically, it is deeper, more profound, because she has plunged herself after 62 years of prayer, right? She knows him intimately. She knows the fire. And and so Thomas, and I think Thomas will absolutely agree, he'll say, reason can only bring you so far, but faith is a gift. In the same way, like, I can look at that girl, but if she doesn't say hello to me, I can go stalk her on Facebook like I know students do. But there's only so much until she gives you a gift of herself. She opens herself up, and she speaks to you, and then you have that. And then hopefully your, your relationship changes dramatically. 
But I think one of the things, hopefully, you get to see with faith and reason that, that Albert, and Thomas, um, and my brothers and I is that they don't oppose each other because Christianity is supposed to deal with a personal relationship. It has to actually deal with love. And so the kind of dynamics that occur between people in love, whether they are human, angelic, or a human, uh, an angel, a human being, or God, they're not identical, they cannot be, but you can learn from them. They can, they can, they can help us to understand the kind of knowledge that at least Christianity, and, and when, when my last class we were talking about this, you know, one of the things I have to point out is that not every religious tradition has this account of faith and reason. I actually have friends who are, especially coming from the evangelical tradition, who when we have this conversation, they struggle with it because they have, their theological tradition has an account of reason that is a lot more wounded than the Catholic tradition has it. So they're like, how do you know all the stuff that, we, that you just talked about? It could just all be lies. The devil could be in your mind putting thoughts, you see? And once you have that, so, and so they say, all I've got is faith. All I have is faith. But, but as a Dominican and, and as a Catholic, because of this robust sense of faith and reason, reason is wounded? Absolutely. We make mistakes all the time. Ask my research students. It takes hundreds of times to get an experiment done. And even then, we have to do it again. And we do it again to make sure that it's... So reason, even though it's powerful, is wounded. But we can still find truth. And I think that's where, that's where my friends and I, especially when I was at MIT, there was a big struggle because I had very close friends coming from the evangelical tradition who would struggle with evolution. They struggle with evolution because they say, well, they would say the fossils were implanted by the devil in order to trick us, right? And I say, once you go down that route, I, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. But if you go down that route, science becomes completely unintelligible because science could just be the devil planting data all over the place, you see? And, and then I always point out, at the end of the day, you have to ask this question. The intellect is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the Christian has to say that at some point, God would allow that intellect to be able to attain some truth, especially about himself, because that is why he gave that intellect and that will to the human creature. Now, this is within a theological context, of course, and becomes a theological discussion, which is why it's great. But it has very practical ramifications. Because now I have friends who have what are called a, a two-truth no, notion of truth. There's two truths. Scientific truth and a theological truth. So they will say, I, when I go to church, the world is 7,000 years old, plus or minus 1,000 years. But when I go to the lab, the world is, well, the world is 5 billion years old. The, univer the, the, the universe is 13.8 billion years ago. And, th and they hold these two, and they have to hold these two. And what I notice is that... Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why I deal with this in faith and reason, and, and not only in my own life, but in the life of the students that the Lord sends into my laboratory, is because if you had to choose, many students choose science. If they were asked to choose between their faith and their reason, they will choose their reason. Because at least they have a direct experience of the truth of their reason. And so part of the challenge and the great privilege, actually, of being, you know, working at this thing is to show them that both, that both play, can play in the same sandbox. And, I mean, every, I had a student yesterday said, Father, every time I leave that class, I have a massive headache. But I love, but, 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 like, for one week, I'm just thinking about, like, the God is the verb. This was like, this is two weeks ago. It's like, and, and you hear about it, because I'll have their roommate's roommate, so I'll, I'll have people stop me on the street like, Father, you're not, I'm not in your class, but I heard that God is a verb. What's up with that? You know, and I think that's the adventure of faith and reason. Thank you again very much. I have to let you out to go to, for your one o'clock um, times.